I'm here today coming to you from my mobile office from my work truck and I'm here to answer a question today about syncope and the question is when do we need to be concerned about syncope versus near syncope and when can we be a little bit more bold about sending people to the hospital BLS and such so uh, I want to dispel a couple of, of rumors and I want to talk about some things that make syncope particularly high risk so first and foremost syncope and near syncope are the same disease. There really is no difference. The only difference is in one, the person completely loses consciousness and the other, the person almost loses consciousness. Other than that, there really is no difference and the same disease processes can cause both. So really it's it's a not much of a distinction between the two. So what really is syncope? Syncope occurs when you have a disruption of blood flow to the brain and particularly the reticular activating system in the brain, which is the part that, that maintains consciousness. And when you lose that blood flow, then the person loses consciousness. Uh, typically what happens is the person then goes to the ground and gravity then brings blood back to the brain and the person wakes back up again. And most causes of syncope are relatively benign. The patients are very low risk and they recover and they do just fine. And when you do workups to try to figure out the cause of the syncope, the majority of the patients are what we call idiopathic, meaning that no one ever really figures out a cause, or it's assumed to be vasovagal, which is just a reflex cause of syncope. So when do you need to be really concerned? Now, there are some specific patient populations that you should be more worried about. Um, and just to paint a, a picture of how bad things can cause syncope, um, it can go all the way up to and including runs of V-fib, where the person goes into V-fib basically has a transient cardiac arrest and goes down and then spontaneously converts out of the V-fib and wakes up. And then that can present exactly like any other syncope. And other really bad causes of syncope are known to be STEMI. Um, seizures can masquerade as syncope. Um, pulmonary emboli. and There are all kinds of horrible things that can cause it. So syncope can really be a near-death experience. And so you have to distinguish which patients that have syncope do you need to be really worried about and which ones can you be a little bit less worried about? So first and foremost, any patient that has a syncopal event should get a 12 lead EKG. We want to do our best to try to exclude a cardiac rhythm cause as the cause of the syncope. And sometimes because you guys are chronologically so much closer to the event than the hospital is, it's really good to get a snapshot of what their heart's doing in those moments that you see them. So just think syncope EKG. Every once in a blue moon, you'll capture either um, you know, a high-grade heart block or STEMI or some other cause. Most of them are going to come out being normal. But just remember, syncope, EKG. Even in pediatric patients, syncope, EKG. So who are the particularly high-risk patients? So the older you get, the more likely that the cause of the syncope is something more dangerous. So it doesn't mean that an 80-year-old can't go to the hospital BLS after syncope, but boy, you better be careful because they're very likely to have something significant causing it. So, who are the high-risk groups? The older you get, the more high-risk you are. People that have a known cardiac history, particularly a CHF history, because they're always at high risk of arrhythmia, and arrhythmia is, of course, a major dangerous cause of syncope. Um, any patients that are having associated chest pain or shortness of breath at the time of their syncope. People with known valvular heart disease uh, or structural heart disease. Um, Let's see, other causes of syncope. Um, people that have syncope with exertion. So people, even young people, that get syncope when they're working out. That is always considered high risk because they may have had an episode of ventricular tachycardia or something else that's life-threatening. And you capturing that on your EKG and getting that patient to the hospital can be life-saving for them. Um, so, and just be, just be wary of any patient that recovers from syncope and has really abnormal vital signs. So hypoxia, tachycardia, hypotension, things like that. Anything that really jumps out to you as uh, abnormal in their vital signs should warrant being kept on the monitor all the way to the hospital. Um, and any patient who has not returned back to normal, most patients with syncope by the time you get there should be feeling pretty much back to normal. When you get someone who's still looking bad, uh, that should be uh, taken as a high risk feature. And the last thing I'll mention is just be wary that seizures can really masquerade as syncope. Um, not every seizure has convulsions associated with it. Do take a good look at the patient, ask about seizure history, and look at the tongue. The tongue is a telltale sign of a seizure. When you see on the lateral sides of the tongue, 
that they've been chewing on it, that is less likely to be syncope and more likely to be seizure. Some patients will bite their tongue during syncope. Um, and when they bite their tongue because they fell, they usually bite the tip. But if they've been chewing on the sides, it's much more indicative of a seizure or if they've been incontinent. So anyway, I hope you find this helpful. Um, just remember, most syncope is benign, but every once in a while, even in young people, syncope is a harbinger of something really terrible. So have a low threshold. If anything looks abnormal, vital signs abnormal, to just keep them on the monitor and follow up to the hospital. Anyway, uh, see you out there and keep the questions coming.